One minute. Rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, thank you. Roll call, please. President Van Fork, please. Here. President Pro Tem Narsh. Here. Councilmember Hobbs? Here. Councilmember Lamb? Here. Councilmember Luxinger? Here. Councilmember Matheson? Here. Councilmember Rook? Here. President Van Portfleet, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Item four on our agenda this evening is presentations, and the item is intent to issue the downtown development bonds and reimbursement from proceeds. Mr. O'Neill? Do you have an opening statement, sir? Yes, thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. We have Jeff Aronoff with us from Miller Canfield, and we have Robert Benzinski and Steve Hado from Benzinski Municipal Advisors. They are your bond council and your municipal advisors on should you uh, issue the bonds. Uh, I asked them to come tonight. I watched Jeff's presentation to the DDA. I thought it was very, very uh, all-inclusive. So I've asked him to give that presentation, and that will be followed up by Benzinski, and they will talk about anything that you want to talk about, answer any questions. Uh, no question is stupid. Uh, we want everybody to be as formed as you possibly can. So moving forward, everybody's on the same page. Because I know there's a lot of misinformation out there. And uh, I think this goes hand in glove with the DDA and Village Subcommittee. This, this is perfect segue as I, as I see it. So with that, I'd ask Jeff to. Mr. Arnott, sir. And my intentions would be I have a, a few uh, requests for comments from the public on this. So after the presentation, we'll look to address that as well. Great, thanks. It's a pleasure to be before all of you. And um, you, know, you mentioned, Mr. President, that you have uh, questions. And that's good because while you know we're calling what the discussion we had with the DDA a presentation, it was really just the result of the question and answer between the board uh, and and myself presenting the resolution to the board. So certainly this council, uh, I would expect we would have something similar. Um, so just an I guess just an outline of what this bond issue is uh, in terms of like its structure, the relationship between the. DDA and the village <clears throat> as issuer and sort of partner on the bonds. Any DDA bonds that are backed by what we call a full faith and credit or general obligation, that the taxes and general fund of the municipality that incorporates the DDA, let's say in this case the village, those bonds are always issued by the municipality, not by the DDA. Uh, so these would be bonds that are um, secured by two sources. First, the tax increment revenues that are captured by the DDA pursuant to the TIF and development plan. But, and, and as, as Bobby and Steven, I'm sure, will we'll discuss when you're talking to them, 
Bonds that are just secured by TIF revenues are generally very difficult. Um, I, I don't want to say impossible, but, but uh, if they use that term, I'd believe them, but they might just stick with difficult. Very difficult to sell on the market. Um, we call that like a naked TIF. That is nothing um, underlying it, no stronger security. What the market usually requires is the general obligation pledge of the incorporating municipalities, kind of a secondary but really stronger pledge. That's what the market looks to when they're doing this, their credit. It's no different than someone applying for a loan, an individual applying for a loan or credit, they're looking to the credit strength of the applicant. Same thing with the bond issue. You are, by issuing bonds, you're taking out a loan from whoever is uh, buying the bonds and they want to know they're going to get paid back and so they look to that security. And since TIF is always a little bit less predictable than a general obligation pledge, they like to have both. And so that's really what's, that's what's happening here. DDA TIF bonds that are backed by the general <laughs> obligation of a village are pretty common. Um, I think one of the things I've, I've heard asked is, so what are we on the hook for as the village? Do we have to uh, levy a tax? I think that question came up somewhere along the way. Not only under, under what we call a limited tax general obligation pledge, so you may have seen in the, in the resolution, it says limited tax general obligation. That means that the village's responsibility, the village's obligation as a sort of secondary uh, source of security for the bonds is only based out of its existing taxes and taxing power. It does not have to levy a new tax. In fact, it has no legal authority to raise any new taxes to support these bonds. So the idea is simply DDA captures tax, and this is how the bonds would be paid back. DDA captures tax increment revenues, that's the expected uh, source of payment on the bonds. And usually that's what happens. And if ever there are insufficient tax revenue, tax, uh, tax increment revenues, then bondholders would say, we need to be paid out of something. Let's, the, the village's general fund from its existing sources is that something. And the way that works also is if ever the village, as the again, sort of guarantor of these bonds, ever has to pay debt service, there is a mechanism in the documents that requires the DDA to reimburse it when those funds are available. So that's the basic concept as to how these bonds work, and that is the basic description of how they're expected to get paid, again, expected out of tax increment revenues captured by the DDA. The village is the technical issuer of the bonds because of that general obligation pledge of its existing, existing taxing power, existing funds, uh, and that's how those, those two sources are kind of bound up together as the security for the bonds. And then when the, you know, as you know, the DDA um, did its sort of authorization, which really amounts to uh, its pledge of the tax increment revenues and then a request to the village to be the issuer of the bonds, and when, when and if the village council decides to work through the um, bond authorizing resolution, that would be really the last step that any body takes, any you know council or board. The bonds would be authorized, and then you delegate to um, your sort of uh, executive and finance staff to sell the bonds pursuant to the financial parameters that you would approve, meaning not to exceed you know, $5 million, not to exceed a certain interest rate. Those are, that's sort of like, I always say that that's the worst case scenario. You approve the worst case scenario. The, this is the highest interest rate that we would pay. This is the most that we would issue. And so we delegate to say the village manager to sign up the deal if it's this deal or better. And if it's not, there's no authority to sell the bonds. You'd have to come back to the village council. So that's what we call, that's how we establish parameters, we call them in these bond resolutions. Um, I, I think maybe more than just me talking, I, I, I'd love to answer questions so we can make sure we're talking about the things that you are interested. That's most of what we did when we were talking to the DDA board. It was kind of a back and forth of questions. So I'm happy to answer anything you got. I, I think that would be very welcome.
as we continue to go along in your presentation. Because there's um, a number of uh, uh, misperceptions out there. Because as you were just talking, sir, a lot of people are concerned about taxes. And when you talk about like the DDA not being able to possibly fulfill its obligation, have you examined that and the possibility of that as to the strength of the DDA being able to fulfill that obligation? Um, well, as your, as your lawyer, that wouldn't be really my, uh, and, and actually even, even Benzinski, they would, you know, you, you do a, you do kind of a, a cash flow analysis, but ultimately the, the, uh, source of that analysis is going to be the market, right? The, the, you'll have a, a credit rating that'll be based, you know, somewhat on the, on the, the DDA, but really mostly on the village's financial strength. Um, in terms of the DDA's ability to cover debt service, that is simply a function of the anticipated tax increment revenues in, in the plan. Um, right. that's, what, that's how you calculate what's available to pay debt service. And, and go ahead, can you tell us what those might be? Uh, they're in, I, don't, I don't have your DDA plan in front of you, but okay. you have a, a taxing, the DDA board and uh, this body would have adopted your, your full tax increment revenue plan and there's a chart um, that projects, you know, for the entire duration of the plan, the tax increment revenues. Right. Mr. Narsh. Okay, I'm, I'm going to come at it from a different angle, and thank you very much for uh, that explanation. Um, so on these um, uh, obligation uh, bonds, what is the average term of those bonds? So you could go out, let's say, 20 years. That's sort of, uh, we were think we were sort of thinking 15 or 20 years um, for the bond issue. That's kind of a standard uh, term. It often, well, it always depends on what you're financing. Okay, so your uh, financing has to, the, the term of the financing, that is the length of it, has to uh, not exceed really the useful life of what you're financing. So from time to time, let's say, um, this is not the case here in the village or the DDA, but just as an example. Sometimes we'll do financings that involve equipment, uh, technology that's got very short useful lives. Uh, in those cases, both for state law purposes and for federal tax purposes, you wouldn't be able to finance a very long-term bond. In the case of property acquisitions and construction of buildings, roads, the infrastructure, that sort of thing, parks, that sort of thing, uh, you do tend to see uh, longer, uh, you know, longer duration bonds. So uh, let's grab a figure of five million, mm -hmm. and uh, that would be for property. And are are, are we at double A or triple A? What's our rating? The village. I think it's double A. Double A. Um, okay. Back to That's the bigger battery. Triple A is the smaller one. No. Well, um, AAA, so it, it AAA is the best rating. Okay, right. I, I'm no. Bobby Benzinski from Benzinski Company. So the, the question then is if at, uh, at that rating, at $5 million, uh, let's say for 20 years, what would be the anticipated annual repayment that the DDA so would be looking at? DDA bonds cannot uh, exceed the duration of the plan. The plan allows for a levy, final levy of 2039, and the um, average annual debt service projected at 4%? 4%. 4 is approximately 200, I'm sorry, $390,000 a year. Back to a question that was brought up of the revenues, um, the plan, the DDA plan, projects revenues in excess of $780,000 a year. So quick math, you have almost double the coverage, okay? So you've got $390,000 of debt service, you've got almost $800,000 of revenue. 400, 800, okay, close enough. Reed. Sir, we have a, <clears throat> we have a, I believe it's a debt schedule here uh, in our uh, packet. And in 2023, it listed at 255,000, and it increases uh, up to 20, 2040 at 375,000. It's on our packet page 88. 
Is that not what we're talking about as far as the debt service? What was repayment? I don't have that schedule. I, I'm sorry. I'm, this is, I'm Stephen Haydock. I'm with Benzinski and Company as well. You said 255,000 was the debt service that you're looking at. I don't. Have yeah. That. So the bonds will mature on the first day of October in each of the years that follow. <laughs> 255000 Is that for $5 million or was that for? Uh, yes. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, on the top it says $5 million. It does. Mm -hmm. Correct. So it goes from 255000 in 2023 to 375000 in 2040. So I'm just looking for a oh, slight well, correction. You know what I think he's looking at is the form of notice of sale. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so okay. you're looking at the principal portion the, only. Thank you. Ah. I'm sorry. There. No, yes. so you don't. That, have, okay. that makes that makes sense. We're looking at our schedules that we projected for the DDA. Good to know. Yeah. Oh. So thank you. That's the principal payment. That the makes first sense. Two hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars. If it's three ninety, it, the principal goes up as we so get further So there's more <laughs> principal paid off at the end, and then with the interest included, then you you end up with about a, a level payment each year of about three hundred ninety thousand. Okay. So $390,000 a year approximately with double that in uh, resources. Correct. Okay. All right. And, you know, one of the things, because the taxpayers keep, ta our, our voters keep talking about taxes and taxes, and, and they've been misled to some degree about how this is all going to be a tax increase to them. And uh, one clarification I'd like to make is if the DDA were to default, on this obligation, then it becomes uh, monies that are available through other revenue sources within the village, which could be taxes, mm -hmm. but it could be other revenue resources, correct? It's the general funds of that's the village. Correct. Yep. And I want to make sure that that's just kind of pointed out. It's not like, oh, so your taxes are going to increase dramatically because of this. We're all trying to manage this risk and looking this over. There's a lot of discussion to be had on this yet, quite honestly. But um, there's a lot of other revenue resources within our community as well. And just to be clear, while, while yes, it's, it's not limited to taxes, you can, you know, to the extent the village would be on the hook, it's, of any, it's on the hook based on any available funds. There is no legal authority for the village to levy new taxes in support of this debt. It's just... Not, in order to do that, there would need to be an election. Go ahead, Mr. Narch. And then uh, the other question I have is, um, you've probably looked at our debt limit, and this as a um, general fund to, uh, burden, uh, we're not anywhere near in jeopardy or near that um, bondable or taxable limit, correct, for bonds? So... Um, I prepared this statement of legal debt margin that's in the packet, and based on the village's 2022 state equalized valuation of $217 million, the village's debt limit or debt capacity is 10% of that as an overall debt limit. Um, there's currently $6.3 million of debt outstanding but of that is $5.2 million of revenue bonds, which don't go towards the village's debt limit. So you have a debt limit of $21 million with $1.1 million outstanding that goes against that, leaving $20,655,000. And in your history uh, of reviewing municipalities, where would you say that we stand um, uh, in, in the percentage of debt ceiling, debt limit for bonds in our general revenue? Extremely low. Extremely low. Extremely and low. understanding how revenue bonds do not um, go against the general fund debt, was that uh, revenue bonds, were those taken out for the purpose of the sewer lift stations, or was that from the water fund project? That was a sewer lift station sewer lift that was station. done in 2000 and. 18? Yeah, 17 or 18. 17, 17 18. 17, 18. COVID's got me all mixed up. Right. <laughs> I lost okay. a few years. So that would, have, um, that would have been our water, and, that, not the lift station. The lift station we're about to. So that would have been our um, three-phase 
uh, water main project. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. so it was yeah, a water main. GWS or so, so, so okay. and, and this was a question that was out there, and I'm, so I'm trying to bring that forward. So we have, uh, is it 17 or 19, I think, uh, sewer lift stations that are, you know, like 1890s era equipment. I mean, it's, they're I ready to die. 16. 16, so they're ready to die. So w we have an urgent need to, uh, through our water and sewer, uh, issue these revenue bonds for approximately six million to replace uh, these sewer lift stations. And that's a, that's a critical infrastructure need that's happening. We've discussed that in the community and now we have been counseled that it's something that we need to proceed on. But those are two different trains on two different tracks. Correct. And the sewer lift station bonds or the revenue bonds are not going to increase our debt limit or affect our debt limit on the revenue side. Or that, that is correct. They, okay. they, under Michigan law, and I'm not, I'm not the lawyer, but they, they do not affect your legal debt margin, but you have to establish rates on an annual basis to meet those uh, debt service requirements. Okay. And gentlemen, there's also capital improvement bonds separate of this discussion that we've had so far. Correct. So the capital improvement bonds are kind of a, a catch-all type bond issue that you, you can do, but they carry a separate 5% limit, but that limit is, in, is part of the 10% overall limit. So it's within that. You have a 5% debt limit of $10.8 million, but that 10.8 is within the, the $20 million that I mentioned earlier. So, so if you issued $10.8 million of capital improvement bonds, you would reduce your overall 10% debt limit by $10.8 million, cutting it in half theoretically. Okay. And sir, do you have a continuation of your presentation that you'd like to go no. at this point with? Yeah, I mean, really, the, I just I, I appreciate that it's referred to as a presentation, but really, even the DDA discussion was mostly question and answer, so I really want to take your Mr. guidance Lamb. on the questions. Thank you. I, I, I don't know your names. Jeff. 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 And Bobby Benzinski, Stephen Haydock. Thank you. I, I, I'm not an attorney, and this is all very confusing. Fair enough. So I've got a couple of questions. They may be difficult, and I don't expect you to answer them. If there's some conflict with some question, I don't expect you to answer them if you don't want to. But before you ask, I think it's important to remember, we, both the financial advisors and us, the village is our client. We represent you. You know, we're not, we're not here to influence your decision other than to give you enough information to make a decision. We advise you and you decide, so, uh, you know, I just want to make sure that's clear with that. You're asking your lawyers questions, so or your financial and your advisors. municipal advisor. Yeah. We represent the issuer. The village is the issuer. Great, that's great. So I, I appreciate all the comments, and and I really appreciate the opportunity to have this meeting where you can present, and answer the questions, and we don't get slammed with, you know, request for a yes or no. So I, I read all the documents. There were a lot of them. They came through um, most graciously. Mr. O'Neill sent them out, you know, so we had at least a week to read some of them. And then the rest of them I had a few days. So I was looking at this uh, statement of legal debt margin. And um, that was prepared by Bedins Benzinski and company. Benzinski. Yep. Please forgive me. No, <laughs> close enough. <laughs> yeah. And so it, it starts out, it says that the state equalized value of the village is $217 million. And then it says the debt limit is 10% of that, uh, $21 million. And then it says um, the amount of our outstanding debt is $6.3 million, $6 million. And then this number, $5,270,000, what is that number? Those are revenue bonds. That's so, the proposed bond? No, that, that's what the village currently has outstanding. So, okay, so we currently, okay, those are the revenue bonds. Yeah, for the, the water system. Um, so that $6.3 million, that's the total debt outstanding. And of that $6.3, 5270000 are revenue bonds. And those are taken out on this statement of legal, legal debt margin because the revenue bonds don't count towards the debt limit. And the major, the one million one, and I think all of it, maybe 
I know for sure a majority of it, it relates to debt issued by the county on your behalf. Okay, but it's village debt, correct? Okay. You're responsible for debt that the county has issued on your behalf. So we have seven million, uh, seven million five hundred thousand approximately in total debt right now. This the six point three is the total. Okay, six point three is the of total, the including the okay. Yep, of the six point three, only one point one goes towards the debt limit. Okay, great. And then uh, debt limit five percent of SEV again. Uh, that is with regard to bonds under the. Um, Those are capital improvement bonds, which can be used. That, for that number comes from. Uh, I didn't bring all my papers. Where does the five percent limit come? There's a state law. So. Act. Jeff could probably speak to the 5% better. Right, so there's the Michigan Revised Municipal Finance Act has a, actually that, we won't get too pedantic here, but that's <laughs> mostly uh, a statute that governs the process of issuing bonds. I just couldn't remember the name, but, I'm sorry. Yeah, Act 34 of 2001, it's the capital improvement yep. bonds are the one, basically the one type of bonds that are actually authorized in that act, and they allow you to finance virtually any capital improvement, but as Stephen said, they have their own debt limit, which also Stephen said is not in addition to your 20. Think of it as a category within that 20 that has its own limit. And that's Act 34 of 2001. I forgot my copy. I have a nice copy with yellow stuff on it. It's a very interesting document. <laughs> <laughs> very difficult to read. Yeah. <laughs> and confusing. So. My former partner wrote it. I'll pass along his compliments. Yeah, it's, it's, it's have difficult. to say our firm was involved, too. <laughs> All right, now it's, so now the next part I don't like you to take personally. All right? But uh, the next part, Section 1, your, uh, the, the annotation here um, references Act 279 of the Public Acts in Michigan in 1909 as amended. And uh, germane to this particular discussion, we would be referencing the Home Rule Village Act, Act 278 of 1909, right? Correct. I understand that most of the people that sell bonds and stuff are cities or, or not little villages. It's so a typo I, on our part, I apologize. Yeah. yeah, so that's where my question lies, okay? And this is, I've, I've struggled with uh, numerous people to get a definitive answer, like a court case or anything, but the, um, and please excuse me, for, for this, putting you through these, this questioning. Um, in the Home Rule City Act, it says that uh, the VIDI, they can have a debt limit up to 10% of the assessed value of all the real and personal property in the city. The um, Home Rule Village Act says um, incurred debt incurred debtness by the issue of bonds or otherwise, which means all debt for the village, I believe. All debt, bonds, any debt. Just let me yeah. run through and then I'm sure you know more about this than I do. And in a sum that includes indebtedness exceeds 10% of the assessed valuation of real and personal property within the village. And then there's a couple more words in this particular law. It says subject to taxation. So uh, uh, interpreting those minute differences in the law are not something I am capable of, but I can question them. So, so I raise that question. So then I have this um, Oakland County 2020 report assessed valuations that you referenced earlier. And there's a couple interesting facts here. There are, one, there's an assessed value of the village of 213 million for real property, not for personal property. Then there is a equalized value of 213 million. And then lastly, there is something called the taxable value of the village at 157 million. So my question to you is, is the debt limit, and it's a difficult question, I'm not sure if I'm explaining it probably, is the debt limit should be based on the 157 million because the language in the Home Rule Village Act states that it's the 10% of the assessed valuation of the real and personal property within village subject to taxation. And that, is that a caveat? I don't understand. So you mean but the subject to taxation piece? Subject to taxation. Okay, so so that's, that's where the, some numbers that, that I had discussed previously came up. Right, so the, the way to read that is that is the assessed valuation. Now, yes, there is 
um, the assessor of a given municipality makes their initial property valuations, and then those are um, you know, assessed at, or those are equalized at the county level and equalized at the state level to one half of fair market value. When we, so there's, there's uh, generations of case law and otherwise that have defined assessed value, not taxable value, which you mentioned, we'll get to that in a second, right? To mean state equalized value. Because otherwise, if, if assessed value just meant the initial assessment, the problem there would be you would disregard equalization, which is a way of putting everybody's property valuation on an equal footing across the state. So assessed value, when, when a debt limit is calculated off of assessed value, the state equalized value is what's used. You will see certain debt limits and certain uh, measurements in statutes are calculated off of taxable value, which is the taxable value that goes through a, a modifications based on Headley and other, you know, Prop A and a bunch of other adjustments that I'm sure everyone's here is familiar enough with. We don't need to get into too much detail, but of course, uh, taxable value is constrained by those other things and is going to be lower than state equalized value. Now you said subject, subject to taxation. In that sentence, all that means is the state equalized value of taxable property, meaning property not held by nonprofits, property not held by exempt owners that would not have property on your, on your tax rolls because you don't levy taxes against them. And your, your tax roll, that is the role of the taxable property in the village is what governs your state equalized value and also your taxable value. And in this case, with state equalized value, it is the denominator for your for your debt limit calculation. So subject to taxation just simply means property not held by some tax exempt entity. That doesn't count in the SEV formulation. Is there something you could send me to allay my fears? Uh, what's, your, what's your fear exactly? My fear is that the, that the village's actual debt limit is 25% is less than the 20 million. Um, and that, that it's village, based on taxable value. Yeah, at the village, at the village, uh, quite often I've noticed in the village since I've been here for two years that everybody seems to think this place operates like a city, but there's a set of laws that, that are pertained only to the village, and most of them aren't, haven't been affected by a lot of these changes over the years. They're always the cities, the amendments to the city home rule, but never the village. So these really antiquated old village laws seem to have some standing. And so I'm, I'm just concerned that the yeah, I mean, if you is, is much, much less than the 20 million. Yeah, uh, if that's, uh, we're happy to draft a legal opinion on the definition of assessed value in the General Law Village Act, if that's what's if requested. It be too much, I would feel much better about it. Well, <clears throat> I think it's just the, there's a difference between the village and the city with those three little words, subject to taxation. So if you could find anything that shows that there's well, to be clear, though, even the, the so subject to taxation doesn't mean taxable value. Again, it's the property subject to taxation. Mm -hmm. So is so, that not true for cities? No, that, that's absolutely true for cities. Then why is it in the cities? It's, you know, I, sometimes the legislature says the same thing two different ways. Um, you know, when we, in, in law school, we learn these rules of statutory construction that if the legislature meant the same thing, they'd say it the exact same way. But in fact, when statutes are written at different times by different legislatures and amended at different times, they are often saying the same thing using different words. But, um, you know, I... I don't want to tell you the year of the act for both of them, because it's the same. No, I understand, but if you look at the small print, at the bottom of that section, you'll see a series of amendments over many years. So while they might have both been drafted at the same time, I can tell you that the General Law Village Act and the Home Rule City Act have been amended maybe hundreds of times in different years. So if we were to, you know, to pull, I, I don't know if we have any law books, they're all on computer right now, but if we were to pull the initial statutes at the time of drafting, they would look nothing like they are today. In fact, the debt limit provisions have probably been, uh, had been the subject of some amendments over the last 115 years or so. I'd love to see something. That's, that's not we're too much trouble. Yeah, we're happy to. 
uh, I mean, I, we can draft a legal opinion. We, we prefer to do that at the request of the body, not at the request of an individual member, but um, that's, I want to make sure that we're following proper protocols here. I, I, I won't put you through the ordeal of me attempting to get a request through the body. So let that be my comment and question okay. for you. Thank you very much for listening. Sir, do you have anything else? I'm sorry, Ms. Washington. Just any other questions, sure. Um, out of the proposed bond for the DDA, how much of that five million total would go to our debt limit, that 20 million debt limit? Would there be any way to put this towards other not or other you know buckets that don't apply to our debt limit? Five million would go against the debt limit. 100% would go yeah. against, against the $20 million debt what, limit. Whatever amount you end up borrowing, if it's $5 million or 4.7 or, or 5.2, it's all going to be towards the debt limit. Okay. And so if we need to take out 15, or more than $15 million, we're, we're out of luck. Well, there's, there's various ways you could do it. Um, the water bonds were issued through the state revolving fund, and they were issued as revenue bonds, but when you issue bonds, revenue bonds to the state revolving fund, they treat them as if they were general obligation bonds. They do not require a bond reserve, they do not require rate covenants, they do not require additional uh, bond covenants if you were to issue additional bonds. So, you know, as you look at your infrastructure, the one thing you may consider is going through the state revolving fund. They offer lower than current market rates, and they don't, they're not as stringent on the bond covenants. So you may look at you know, issuing that. You may look at issuing a portion of them as revenue bonds and a portion of them as general obligation bonds. Um, it's a discussion you should have with your financing team. Mr. Nersh. Um, and, and that's kind of the thing I'm trying to separate and clarify is when you look at what is the greatest infrastructure needs that we have, we still have our final phases of our um, water infrastructure. And I think some of that was that um, state revolving fund, was it not? That's that, how we're issuing them. The, okay. So when we look at what is our anticipated, um, that's going to be revenue bond. And it's different. So that's why I kind of bounced back to, um, and I asked that question because I wanted people here to kind of get the same answer that I wanted, but to understand the bigger picture, if we have a $20 million bond limit, our, our biggest infrastructure, I mean, there's always unanticipated things and nobody likes to borrow stuff, right? But most of our, what we know of infrastructure debt is gonna come out of revenue bonds. So out of that 20 million general bond, uh, tax bond or our debt bonds, if you will. Um, again, I asked that question. Y you've got experience in this, and in your experience of municipalities our size, would you say that we are in uh, the lower end of um, our, our bond limit, that, that we're in fairly good shape for communities our size? Yes, very much so. I mean, you, you have a $21 million limit you have six million dollars worth of debt, and only 1.1 million is subject to that debt limitation. Okay, and I want to hard stop on that. So that's kind of what I'm asking everybody here to absorb and grab: is that we're, we're not in trouble. A um, couple of council meetings ago, we talked about this, the the issues we have ahead of us, and I made the comment that you know this is Lake Orion; we face these things before, I mean, I've walked this walk with you for almost 40 years and saw some of these issues come and go, but we always attack them, we always resolve them. And we're probably in better fiscal and financial shape to take on some of these issues today than we were at some of the bigger issues 20 and 30 years ago. So we're in a fairly stable environment. And let me also state that the debt limit is a limit as of October 17th 2022 we have new development that you have yeah. new tax new state equalized valuation coming on board in 23 you have debt coming off if you were to do nothing 
Okay. Right. So as your tech, as your state equalized valuation goes up and your debt goes down, you continue to make payments, that limitation can get brought larger. Okay. I just kind of wanted to get that clarification. Thank you. Mr. Lamb. I have to return to the debt limit question because now I'm totally confused. Okay. In this Act 278, it says that the village shall not do any of the following. Incur indebtedness by the issue of bonds or otherwise in a sum including existing indebtedness that exceeds 10%. So that seems clear. Has that been amended somehow? It seems clear that all debt, all village debt is included in the debt limit. No. It, so I, in the Home Rule Village Act, mm -hmm. okay, I mean, it says that. And then in the other act that you, you asked me to read, the one with the 5% limit, it made no reference to this debt limit. It talked about a 5% bond debt limit. It made no reference to 10% limit. Yes. So I, I really think my question is relevant. And I, and I really believe that the village's 10% debt limit includes all village indebtedness. And I don't believe all the, this bond or that bond. I think that's all reflected in the 5% debt limit. But like I said, I've, I've been reading all this stuff for, for many weeks now. I'm tired of reading this stuff. It's confusing. The people are confused. I'm confused. You guys know how to sell bonds. It's, it's all good. But I, that's a very relevant question. And the, as far as the village's financial situation, I just had to make a little comment here. The, you know, the village's, the village has no extra money whatsoever for any future bond. So, you know, making comments on our fiscal soundness at this point, there's no extra income in the village. I understand DDA can fully pay for these bonds with their current revenue stream. That's understandable. But the village has no additional revenue for any, there's no source for any additional debt to be paid for. So don't put that, like, that's true, it is not true. The village has no money to pay for any additional debt without raising user fees or taxes. But this bond, the DDA bond will not raise taxes and it will not change the final structure of the village. It means just the DDA money will go to pay for those bonds instead of going to other sources. I'm curious to know how the DDA is gonna take half of the revenue that they currently spend and pay for bonds now. And then what are they going to do with their other stuff? Stop some of the other activities? So I, these are real relevant questions. I don't want the public to get confused by the talk of the different kinds of bonds and the different state law. So I, I think it'd be, it would be appropriate to issue some opinion as to what the Home Rule Village Act says about the, about the law. So. Anything else, sir? I have a question. Yes, More sir, questions, Mr. happy to answer them. Um, I don't know how to really a ask this question, but has any other DDA in Michigan gone this, this way before? Virtually every DDA bond that's been issued in the last several years is structured this way. They're not all villages, right? There's cities and other municipalities, but um, th this is, I would say, the most common approach to uh, tax increment finance bonds, which are not just DDAs, you know, LDFAs, TIFAs, and so forth. The uh, primary vehicle is a, a, let's say, DDA TIF backed by a general obligation of the municipality. This, this method of financing is very common in Michigan. Um, since 2009-10, when property values declined rapidly in the state of Michigan, um, what Jeff alluded to earlier is naked TIFA or naked DDA bonds. Those have pretty much gone by the wayside. Um, bond investors, they don't, they're not interested in owning whatever's financed. <laughs> they want to get paid mm -hmm. their interest. They want to get paid their money reinvested in something else. So the market, um, and not just in Michigan, this is a national trend that your tax increment financing bonds, TIFA, which covers DDAs, tax, uh, 
tax increment finance authorities, things of that nature. Those have gone by the wayside without the, the legislative body of the incorporated community pledging its limited tax, full faith and credit in some way. Um, because uh, as you probably know, back in 2008 and 2009, not in Michigan, thank God, but in other states, there were defaults on these types of financings. So investors are very fearful still today in 2022 of purchasing investments that do not carry the limited tax or general full faith and credit of the municipality that's incorporated that. Uh, As we know, date. general obligation. General obligation, limited tax, Correct. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So. <clears throat> Anything else? I have a quick question. Yes. How, on average, how much uh, do DDA bonds usually go for? Or is $5 million a, a normal amount? Well, I mean, you can, it varies. It varies by community. Um, one of our size. One of your size, it's probably a typical bond issue. I mean, Troy, for example, issued 19 million, I think, for their DDA along Big Beaver Road. Well, uh, their DDA is big. But, but I'm just saying it's, four times there's ours. really no, that's like saying what community it matches the village of Lake Orion. It doesn't. There's, is there a question? Is there a better way I should ask that question? No, because there is really no way to totally quantify that. You know, a community of your size depends on your needs, depends on what's being financed. Um, there are communities that kind of leverage themselves more so they can get more economic development, or they can get a you know major taxpayer to come in and you know create increased. Uh, state equalized valuation. Was part of your review for this um, the plans they had for this property? They were. We we don't get into legislative policy decisions. Our role as municipal advisor to the village is to look at the project, uh, deal with uh, your bond council and Miller Campfield, making sure that this is a public purpose project and then look at um, the duration of the plan, see if the revenue sources can meet the debt service obligations. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Rutt. Just a quick question. I know you said we would be approving the worst case scenario. Um, so it sounds like worst case scenario would be five million at like six percent. What do you did you mention that an estimated what you're expecting is more like four percent? I don't know if it's being affected by rising interest rates across the board. And right now, we would expect interest rates to be about 4% okay. on, a, on a sale like this. Uh, when they go to sell, <clears throat> it could be higher, could be lower, but I, I wouldn't expect it to swing in a, a ton. I also want to state that the $5 million number, that is the maximum amount of bonds that the DDA told us that they wanted to issue. Right. We are waiting to find out what the cost of the land that they want to purchase is and what the cost of any improvements that they want to do to that land is before we would actually issue the bonds. So we're not going to say, if they say, well, the village council approved it, I'll just pick two weeks from now. I don't know when your next meeting is, okay, but two weeks from now, sell $5 million. We're going to ask as municipal advisors to the village, give us a detailed list of the project cost to make sure that we're at $5 million or less. And if it's less, then that's what we recommend issue. It, correct. <clears throat> that was going to be one of my questions. It could be 4.2, could correct. be 4.5. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work to be done yet. And this is just a very beginning uh, discussion as far as bond council. I do have one uh, kind of an odd question. Um, what about early payback? I've so, heard something mentioned about how there's no funds. There's uh, how will they utilize half of their current uh, funding resources. But I know there's solutions and efforts and a lot of work being done right now to look for those funds. And so do we have to carry them full term or can the bonds be paid off early? No, um, 
generally when bonds are issued um, in this dollar amount and this duration, mm -hmm. they are sold through what is called a competitive bid bond sale. Uh -huh. So that means at a certain date and a certain time, uh, Benzinski and Company's office will receive via the internet bidders that will submit a bid. No one else can see their bid. The bid process is approved by the state of Michigan. It's a nationally used system. It's locked in. And at a certain date and a certain time, no more bids will be received. We will then look at the bids. The bids will have to be for the full amount of the bond issue, whether it's 4.2 or $5 million. Each bidder will have to bid or buy the entire thing. We will recommend um, a lowest interest rate to the village. Generally, bonds of that nature, unless there's some reason that we believe uh, that there should be an early payoff provision, usually are uh, out there about eight or nine years before you can prepay them. Um, if there's some reason, you know, and, and I know this is not the intent, and I want to clarify that, but sometimes municipalities will buy a piece of property to flip it because they want to keep it out of somebody else's hands. And, you know, they will tell their, their municipal advisor and their bond council, we're buying this to flip it. We think we can flip it in three years. So we may put an early call provision in at that point. There is also a penalty for that because when you do a, in this case, it's going to be about a 19-year bond issue, mm -hmm. um, investors don't want their bonds paid off. They want to get them paid off when they're due, not, when, not at early provision. So they don't like that. Market accepts eight, nine years now. So you're saying at like eight or nine years, then the window would open that you could yeah. prepay. prepay them. And yes. whether, whether there was extra funds on hand that you could pay some off, or if interest rates were significantly less at that time, you'd be able to refinance them at a lower rate at that time. Thank you. Mr. Nark, do you have anything else? Um, and, and it really uh, so much wasn't a question for our council. Um, but just kind of a statement backing up because we're having this conversation here and everybody's wondering what is the village or what is the DDA looking at doing on this? And it's not a, a flip so much as, and I, I think there's, and I want to hear more, right? We haven't heard the whole proposal, but I just kind of want to get this out there that for the last 10 years, we've had parking studies. I've been on those. Um, I've performed uh, in a previous role here in the village uh, several parking analysis. We've worked with Oakland County Main Street and had uh, several uh, parking engineering firms come out. And what they look at is how much available parking uh, is there and have you hit your 85th percentile? Are you at 85% max at certain given times? And if you are, then you have to look at as you have the growth in your downtown the restaurants. Uh, I think, what was it, two years ago, we doubled our restaurant seating capacity in one year. Um, so as we're looking at that, parking became an issue. We floated that out there. We did all kinds of studies. Uh, we put it in social media, and everybody came back uh, saying that parking, we did it in our um, uh, several charrettes uh, and different things, and parking was an issue. So going back about three or four years ago, we looked at a public-private partnership of the potential of a parking deck to solve that issue. So a parking deck was $6 million four years ago. And that provided for about 75 to 78 cars, which was like $50,000 a parking space. And that's what a lot of municipalities do. So then we started looking at where you're going to put this behemoth in the village of Lake Orion, make it centralized um, with a $6 million price tag for 75 to 80 cars. My understanding of what this lot potential could do for us is over 130 cars in a flat parking space that would be uh, at the entrance way that would also allow for um, uh, more green space, uh, kind of an inviting entrance to the village as you come in off M24. But more importantly, um, it solves the number one question that almost everybody had uh, over the last 10 years when we asked the question, and that is parking is a problem. And that included every engineering study that we had, including our parking study here. So that, that is kind of, I think, uh, I don't want to step out of, you know, because I haven't heard a full proposal of the use of the property, but I believe 
that's going to be an accurate reflection, which for the bang for the buck, almost double the number of parking spaces in a flat structure uh, for our district would probably solve our parking issues for the next 10 years or more. Uh, so in essence, at half the price. So that's, that's why I'm interested in seeing more on the project. I know it's not for you gentlemen, but it's more for the crowd, is that's what excited me when I heard about this, is it answered that question I've been working on for 10 years with, with several engineering firms and groups at half the price in essence. So uh, that said, um, I, I think there's more to come on that. There's a lot. A lot. Uh, but, but just as a teaser, <laughs> it teased me. And I thought if we could get that much parking in our downtown and still improve that gateway, um, that's, that's a value asset. There is a, uh, for the public, there is a design charrette, October 27th, posted by the DDA with regards to this at 5 p.m. And we look for the public opinion. Actually, I think you're going to be uh, pleasantly surprised. So. Anything else? I'd like to open it up to the public. I've got some questions here. Uh, of people or some yellow slips of people that would like to possibly um, just make some statements. And the first person I'd like to call on, please, would be Laura Gabrielle. <clears throat> Doesn't matter either one. Okay. Um, just listening to this, I'm still obviously confused. The water, the lift stations, is this part of this five million you're talking about or is that a separate thing? I'm, I'm a little foggy about what is going where because I know that the water issues and the lift stations are exceedingly important, more important than anything else at this point because they're so aged. And I'm not sure if this, this bond proposal is taking care of it or is that a separate thing? So I, I need some clarification. That design charrette will help tremendously. The what? The design charrette this Thursday at 5 p.m.? Yeah, I'm going to be here. Good. Okay. Uh, Mr. Scott Gabriel. Hi there, Scott Gabriel. So mine is kind of a cautionary tale. Uh, my family is in Marlboro, New York. About 12 years ago, they had a big... Uh, revenue stream from Con Ed, the big power company up there. They're right on the Hudson River. They anticipated quite a bit of revenue. They put out some bonds. They did a lot of improvements to the village, great improvements, uh, just like this is. I'm not even arguing about this improvement. I think it's one of the best uses you could do for that area. But the deal with Con Ed fell through. Now the village was on hook for that bond issue. It was well north of the five million. Each and every citizen of that small village, Marlboro, New York, if you want to look it up, is on the hook. Their taxes went up $16,000 per household to pay for this. Just like Mr. Lamb said, by tax revenue. We're going to be on the hook for this if, if, and I, God forbid it happens, that something happens with the VDA or this revenue. So that is my, my thing. If you all want to look it up, Mar Marlboro, New York, and Con Ed. Thank you, sir. George Dendelius. Okay. And Adam Fodor. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, my name is Adam Fodor, 33 North Axford Street. Um, I was privy to an email that was floating around that um, a lot of the decisions that are good for the DDA are not good for the village or the residents. And if something was to happen to the DDA, then the village is on the lamb for all of this. Correct? That's what the gentleman explained to earlier. So I would hope that there's a plan for all of that. Included in that was a study that currently there's about $18 million worth of necessary and currently unfunded water, sewer, and road projects in the village. And another study puts that number at around $26 million. So we want to take out a bond for $5 million 
for parking that's been addressed for as long as I can remember. And when I believe it was Dan's excavating, redid downtown, one of the things that was discussed was parking and situations and they discussed head-in parking or parallel parking or other lots or things of that nature. And it was decided that it would make it too modern and it would ruin the aesthetics of downtown. So now we're gonna build some parking structures after just approving a bunch of condo complexes. So in all these meetings that were taking place with Musheri and all these other developers, why wasn't this ever brought up to them? Like, hey, you know, you guys wanna develop all this stuff, but in return, we could use some parking spots and we wanna purchase this piece of property. I would assume before we sign our name on the dotted line with this bond, that we would have some environmental studies done because the lumber yard's been there since the 40s, right? So who knows what that ground could hold underneath it. And we could start digging and very quickly blow through $5 million in cleanup. Just some questions and thoughts. Thank I you, have. sir. Anyone else? Yes, yeah, sir. Mr. Johnson, sir. Corey Johnston, Blake Orion. Um, First of all, I want to thank you for allowing comments on this because it's become a popular public issue for good or bad. Uh, and you had mentioned that there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's basically a lack of information. And I think it's evidenced by you that you're asking questions. You don't understand it any more than probably we do. And we're all part of the public. So I think this is a great opportunity. And hopefully, there will be a better way than this because I don't know that everyone watches council meetings. Um, Secondly, towards the misinformation, and I'm sure most people don't know me because I haven't lived here that long, but uh, I am very much in favor of DDAs. I've promoted them. I have been part of the Main Street Oakland program for probably close to 15 years. Tried to get it in place where I lived before. Didn't, uh, but I still promoted it. I knew all the people at Oakland County and their economic development program. Um, however, I'm a taxpayer. I believe in transparency, and I believe we should all understand where our money's going uh, I live in the DDA district. My taxes will go to this, and I don't need parking. I walked here tonight. I walk almost everywhere, and unless you have uh, some disability of some kind, and, and I'm sorry if you do, you don't need parking if you're paying taxes here. It's a small village. So this is for outsiders who do not pay to be here. Now, I've listened to everything that was presented tonight. I have read through all the information that was provided for the DDA meetings all the way back to the purchase of the property. I read through all the information tonight, and by, I am by no means a bond expert, but I do understand financing. And I still have questions. And I don't expect you to answer these tonight. Um, I don't think you should. I think you should think about it. But I do expect there to be answers for both yourselves and the public prior to any decision being made, whichever way that goes. The first question is, and I understand based on what was said tonight that it may change, how was the $5 million amount established? The second is, how much of that $5 million is available after interest, expenses, and fees? I'm still not sure after what was said tonight if the $5 million is the total cost and all the interest, fees, and costs come out of that. Your counsel here tonight is charging a lot of money. I, I know what lawyers cost and bond consultants. Uh, you're paying for that. It's got to come out of something and then you have the interest. Or is that an add-on to the five million, which means this could easily be a $10 million total cost? You need to know that, I need to know that. What will the annual bond cost be? A function of what that is and how it's financed. And where is the evidence that the DDA will have adequate funds to pay it? I did not see that it was discussed tonight. I have not seen that anywhere, and since you don't know what the bond cost is on an annual basis, I don't know how you know whether there's funds to pay it. What will the cost of the bond and related activities cause, will the cost of the bond and related activities cause the DDA to curtail or limit other activities? Mr. Lamb alluded to that. I don't know the numbers because I don't know the numbers. Is this money solely for use on the lumberyard property? Based on the information that was provided for tonight's meeting, it sounds like it's called the project. So I assume it is basically a dedicated fund for that use only. How will that be done? Is there a business plan for that project? It was mentioned earlier that there will be at some time, which makes a lot of this discussion premature because we don't know the amount, we don't know what's gonna be done with it. I can't get a $5 million loan from a bank 
without telling them something definitive and backing up that loan. I can't just say, I want $5 million, I'm going to do great things with it. I may, but they won't give me the money. Guaranteed. Who controls how these taxpayer fund funds will be spent? Based on the DDA meetings I've attended and watched, it appears that it's not the elected village council, I think you established the budget, but the decisions are made by you, not the planning, by the DDA, not the planning commission, and not you, and it seems it's the DDA. They just approved new lights downtown. That may be a good thing, but I didn't see anything that said anyone else approved that but them. Uh, the purchase of the property, the purchase agreement for the property, was signed by them, not you. I don't believe that ever came to you yet. Maybe it does, I don't know, so I'm asking. Based on that, who does the DDA answer to? If they're a decision maker, they're an appointed board, non-elected, so who do they answer to? I assume it's you. I don't know. Does this agreement obligate the Village of Lake Warren to have a DDA as currently structured for the life of the bond? As you well know, that issue has come up with several petitions. Could come up again. Uh, the literature that was provided for this meeting showed the bond payment over 18 years. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what was in there. And then finally, is it the opinion of the elected village council that this is the best use of $5 million, or whatever that number will be, because I don't know, for the next 18 years, and if so, why? The public's going to want to know that. I thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Ken, I have a question. Yes, Mr. From, from Mr. Mr. Johnston, was it? Yes. yes. Uh, could you email us those questions? Okay. Appreciate it. In fact, you could just drop that right off to the village manager when you leave and he'll just uh, get them out to us. I appreciate that as well. Okay. I'm going to read a couple of uh, requests from the public that came in emails. And just as a courtesy, because they should be heard. This one is from Raymond and Janice. Hammond, residents here in Lake Orion on Florence Street. Please accept this letter into the public record as our vigorous disapproval of your plan to issue bonds for the purchase of commercial real estate on M24, also known as the Lumberyard property. We do not support the DDA Village of Lake Orion entering village taxpayers into debt obligation for any private commercial enterprise of any type. This private property is not a concern to the village beyond zoning and land use oversight. The DDA is far exceeding its role within the village organizational structure by speculating in private, commercial, real estate, regardless of the intended use or outcome. Unless the village plans to purchase this property and convert it into public use for all taxpayers, this is a gross misuse of authority by both the DDA and the village council. No one in a village governor's role has our permission to enter into this type of real estate speculation that could very well expose village taxpayers to future financial and legal liabilities through the commingling of village government debt obligations with private real estate speculation. While we respect the intentions of most local leaders to be well-meaning, this crosses a line that we cannot support. Maybe this venture will work out as planned. It is my position to remind the council members and the DDA that there are times when things do not go as planned. Connecting taxpayer debt to private real estate ventures is a risk that remains outside our level of tolerance, especially in these precarious economic and fiscal times we find ourselves in today. In summary, we reject the proposal to put village taxpayers at risk with this ill-advised venture. Sincerely, Ray and Janice Hammond. Then I have another one. This is from a gentleman that comes in and speaks um, frequently, Mr. Harry Stephen. And this was an email to me today. And he just would like to propose a couple of thoughts and ideas about this project. And there's a lot of these thoughts and ideas currently being considered. Ken, here are my thoughts regarding the DDA bond issue. By the bond being written with the support of the village puts constraints on the village village's potential bonding capacity. With the expected need for infrastructure, I believe that the village needs to have its full bonding borrowing capacity. The interest cost of using bonds for the project will be in the neighborhood of two million. I'd like to offer a different concept, land contract, to bring the cost of the project into a pay-as-you-go program. 
If it could be negotiated, it could benefit the Knowles with an income stream and income tax benefits. That's the property owners currently. The DDA could then do the project on a pay-as-you-go basis. Such an arrangement could allow the project to move forward, preserve the village's bonding capacity, and save hundreds of thousands of dollars. Thank you for your flexibility on my presentation, Mr. Harry Stevens. So I just want to read that in record as well. Again, there's a lot of um, considerations. So we've had the presentation. We've had uh, public opinion, which we greatly appreciate. And at this time, I really want to close this up. You did not fill out a speaker card? No, we did. Please state your name. Hi, my Thank name you. is Reva Beatty. Good evening. So I believe that the DDA is a critical component to keeping our history alive in the downtown, of course, keeping our community thriving. Um, now is a better time um, more than ever to build stronger partnerships with the village and the DDA. Um, but what I'm most concerned about is the economic, economic viability uh, and I question the allocation of our funds for our infrastructure needs. I'm not totally against the DDA redeveloping the lumber yard. Um, I think that it would benefit our downtown, but um, is this the right time? Is it the right location? Um, there are parking areas that I even used one this weekend and I never knew about it. Um, there's areas that are not being utilized for parking as it is. We all know that this area that the lumber yard sits is a congested and kind of a dangerous intersection, but um, the other area that I was going to bring up was the land contract. I think that's um, maybe something that we should consider. That's it. Thank you. Hi, guys. Nicole Curtis. I think our cards are still out there, so apologies. Um, I'm going to kind of second what Reva set up here. Uh, the DDA is set up to be a benefit to the village, to boom businesses, to bring retail in. And we've all, we've all seen the growth that downtown has brought. The hanging baskets are lovely. I love the extra seating. We all love that. But it comes as a, at a cost. And I don't think many people in Lake Orion are very familiar with budgets and spreadsheets and all this. So when they see something come up, they think, well, that's great. But at what cost? Um, it's not good when we are willing to hedge our bets here and take us so close to our debt when we all see what's coming. We have concrete uh, costs rising. All material costs across the board are still rising. I'm in building, um, I can tell you this every single day. So we know that we have a failing infrastructure. We don't have a backup plan. So right now, we're like sending your kid off right now with an unlimited credit card and saying, go do it, and then hoping that his degree that he's going to get, you know, like his, you know, I, I don't know, I have a half a teaching degree, but that that's going to pay off that debt from that unlimited credit card with high interest rates. It's not. Um, and just to, just to bring a few things up, the village of Oxford um, runs on about a $210,000 budget, okay? We're running on an $890,000 budget, and excuse me if my numbers are off a bit here, um, at like 59%. It's, it's just such a huge difference. And we're, we're sister cities here. Um, and I've been to downtown Oxford, and it's lovely. So I, I'm a bit confused, even going through, you know, that right now we're allowing the DDA, you know, no one would like for the lumber yard to be able to, for Jeff and family to be able to move on, make a profit and move on. That's great. Um, but at what cost again? And let's not forget that wasn't it just last year that we shot down the developer that actually wanted to buy, not using our village funds, make use of the lumberyard property to do a development. And we said no to it, because it was too big, it was too cumbersome, it was too this, and we made that developer's life a living hell. But now we've just approved Mosheri to come in and do the exact same thing across the street. So we had an issue with traffic over there, we don't have it over here. Now we want to buy this property, why didn't we look at doing something with our lakefront that everyone is so vested in and saving? So, with all that being said, 
There's also a parking lot for sale in downtown Lake Orion right now. I just came, we just had dinner at Bitter Tom's and parked just fine. So we're going into debt to solve a problem that for people that don't even live here. We're asking for village residents to be on the hook for a problem that isn't ours. As someone that owns several properties in Lake Orion, uh, we come down here all the time to eat. We're down here all the time for different activities and we've already stated on record that a few times a year, we have so much problem with parking. So does downtown Detroit. So does every other village, city, everything else. We find a way to make it work. Go use St. Joe's parking lot, go use Kroger. Let's set up a shuttle system. Let's do something like that. But to put more concrete space in our historic town right now when we don't need it. We need it for five times a year. I was down here at Quake on the Lake. Is that Quake on the Lake? Quake on the Lake, which is a huge event for us in the summer. It's so cool. Um, I'm hoping I can still see it next year after most Sherry builds these monsters across from my lake house. Um, but I still found a parking spot right in front to go have breakfast. That's and everybody true. who knows me knows I don't cook and I eat breakfast all the time downtown. So that's one of the issues. And also just putting on record too, we just did, I think it's 46,000 and some change to replace street lights that we just got done paying off that are less than 10 years old. I was down there tonight. I saw everything just fine with the lights we have. So I'm, I'm very curious why we're not making this more public, why people aren't speaking out more about this, why this room isn't filled right now. So if you're watching this on live TV, uh, please don't be making complaints if you're not gonna show up and actually look at these budgets, because these budgets are real. And I understand the parking studies, we get that. But if anyone drives downtown Royal Oak, that is what you are creating in Lake Orion with these continuous votes for more concrete and more development. Do not put our village at risk in debt and the village residents for something that's a pipe dream, for something that could happen. Thank you Thank for you. your comments. Okay, <clears throat> I would like to just remind, we, we really looked to try to reserve it to the three to five minute limit. And if you would, Ms. Ford, please come on up. I just have some questions um, from people that were speaking tonight, so I just wanted to ask them quickly so that I could be informed. My name is Rosemary Ford, and I'm at 225 North Broadway. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Johnson, in when you had asked uh, that they had wanted you need five... To, I'm sorry, you need to address me. Oh. We don't want to turn it into okay, an Okay, in I apologize, I apologize. Between, okay. between. So what... The one gentleman asked that they want $5 million and what was it needed for. I believe the attorneys explained that, that once they determine the amount, they have to give a detailed explanation to the attorneys before they can go and purchase, look into purchasing those bonds. Am I correct when I was hearing that tonight? There will be a plan. Yes, but I mean, they have to have that in order for them so they know exactly what amount they can go look for. Um, the comment about Marlboro, New York, I'm just curious if that municipality, it was in reference to, did they have a DDA that this amount came into? Just so that when the comments made, I just wanna make sure it's apples to apples. And the other comment that I was confused on is he said there's an email floating around uh, with all this information, and did that go to the general public or did that go to select people? Because we didn't receive any emails um, in reference to these questions about tonight, so I don't know if anybody knew that, and I just wanted to ask that question. Possibly people can answer that for me later. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move in, move on after I again encourage everybody, Charette Thursday. A lot of this conversation can be had there. Things can be cleared up. Okay, moving on from the presentation. Two, consent agenda, or uh, call the public non-agenda items. Are there any non-agenda items? Yes, sir, Mr. Johnson, sir. Public comment? Call it a public. Yes, Thank sir. Um, I actually had a long list of public comments. I'm going to save it for later about uh, pedestrian amenities. I moved here uh, because I loved them. Uh -huh. and they seem to be going downhill, in my opinion, over the, next, over the last year and a half that I've lived here. And I do assessments of facilities, so I sort of know what I'm talking about, but that's for later. Um, and, and, sir, if you wouldn't mind forwarding that again to the building I can manager, do that. I would love to uh, read those. To the, uh, just going back to where we were, to the um, 
charrette that's happening. I have been in contact with my planner friends throughout the country because I'm in a couple groups. We have, I think I have some, they won't be here. I have some good things to present them from. It'll be entertaining, hopefully helpful. Uh, but what I did want to address, um, something you just touched on, is the policies for public comments for the various government meetings. Uh, the written policy of the DDA for public comments, which was adopted on August 9th, is that the board will not respond to any public comment. That's a quote. This is also the unwritten policy of the Planning Commission. I've attended their meetings. It is their policy. Both the DDA and the Planning Commission set an arbitrary time limit of comments at three minutes. It's arbitrary because there is no legal standard for that, so you can set it wherever you want. The DDA at least puts in a writing, which is nice. The Planning Commission does not. The policy of this council is not documented. It's presumably made up as you go. It's pretty vague. There's three different boards that make decisions in one form or another, three different policies. It's not good for the public. Um, I'm not sure what the policy is for filling out the little public comment cards. Uh, and as you see, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. It's not written down anywhere. You walk in the door and you don't know what you're doing. You don't know where to go with it. It doesn't work. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sure there was a good intent. I don't know what it is. Uh, <clears throat> all of this makes it difficult for a member of the public to plan and prepare comments. If I only have three minutes, I need to know that. I don't know that. All of this appears to be arbitrary and contrived because it's made up, you said, three to five minutes. Based on what? I'm not... That is a standard, I know, but I need to know that before I get here, not after. It's a constant ask as a courtesy. Thank you. And as I'm sure you're aware, public, com public, pu public comments are required by Michigan, Michigan's Open Meeting Act. Unfortunately, it's arbitrary. There is some pending legislation that may change that. We don't know. So I really think as the policymaking board for the village, set a standard policy, the public would appreciate it, you would appreciate it, you wouldn't have to fight with people like me or Nicole about <laughs> when and how we can make comments. It'll just make it easier for all of us. Thank you. Very good, thank you, sir. Calls call the public and move on to the consent agenda. Tonight we have five items. Item number one is Downtown Development Authority Board reappointments. Mr. Lloyd Cole and Sally Medina. Item two is approval of Village Council regular meeting minutes from October 10th. Item three, police department reports from September 20th, or September 2022. Number four, director's report from September 2022. Item five, downtown development authority regular meeting minutes from September 13th. Entertain a motion. Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Support. All those in favor, please indicate aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Approval of the agenda. <clears throat> we have nothing to add at this point. Move to approve the agenda. Support. All those in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed? Public hearings, we have none. Agenda items for consideration. <clears throat> item 9A, financial matters, invoice approval, October 24th. 2022 invoice for approval, Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I've reviewed the, the invoices for approval. I've discussed some with our finance director, treasurer. Uh, I will have some uh, discussions with the village board uh, for some possible uh, amendments to the, your budget route based on increased costs in some certain areas. And I'll bring that to your attention. Uh, I also plan on bringing a lot of those, those information together with Mr. McCleary. I'm going to, if you approve his contract, then I'm going to reach out to him and we will meet and I'll have a transition with Darwin. Uh, I haven't seen him in a month of Sundays, but I've known him for many, many, many years. So that won't be a problem. I even suggested that I even bring Joe Young in and help with some of the transition because he's been there a lot longer. I'm going to make it as easy as I can for Darwin coming in. Uh, so with that, the only other, th let me stop right there. Okay, so we have invoice approval. 
Move to approve the bills in the amount of $178,142.27, of which $12,303.18 are DDA bills for a net total of $190,445.45 uh, approved for payment. Support. Discussion, challenges, questions. Roll call, please. Hobbs? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Luxinger? Yes. Narsh? Yes. Van Portsley? Yes. Matheson? Yes. Rutt? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Item B, other items. Approval of employment agreement. Darwin McClary, village manager. Council, would you like to take this, sir? Thank you, Your Honor. Or, er, <laughs> Mr. President, Council. Uh, I worked with Mr. McClary on this just for some background information. We did look to uh, the collective bargaining agreements uh, within the village to keep it consistent with the CBAs. Also uh, consistent with his classification to keep his benefits uh, class one, that's what class he falls under. And then also uh, his previous employment agreement with this village was, was part of this. So based on all those uh, factors, uh, we we're presenting you with this proposed uh, employment agreement. Thank you, sir. Um, I get the ball rolling here. I'll just um, uh, make a motion to accept and approve the employment agreement uh, for the Office of Village Manager between Darwin D.P. McLeary and the Village of Lake Corian and authorize the Council President and the Village Clerk to execute the agreement on behalf of the Village. This agreement is contingent on successfully our successful completion of pre-employment testing and then be it further resolved that upon executing the employment agreement, the start date of the employment would be on or after, and I would ask our attorney if that was resolved. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe uh, Mr. McCleary provided some, uh, a start date of November 28th, if that's a Monday. <laughs> I, it, I'm going off memory, but I believe that was the proposed start date. I think it's the 30th. If we need Maybe that. the 30th. I, I... So if we need that in this. Uh, November 28th is a Monday? Yeah, I believe that was his Correct. proposed start. Okay. It is. And then for my motion, I'll make that um, on or after. Uh, and I think the on or after works for November 28th, 2022. I'll support. Discussion? Questions? Ms. Lester. Um, is there anything in writing for this transition plan that's going to happen between you and uh, Mr. McClary? Uh, no, I have not contacted him. Okay. I, I thought that would be presumptive. But I will contact him and I will arrange something for that week of the 28th. And typically, you know, he's been here before, so I don't see me being here more than three or four days at the most. So. Can I uh, make a request? Your weekly emails, reports? Yes. Slip it in that transition plan. Let him know that it's appreciated. Okay, so we have a motion on four. I'd like to have a roll call, please. Lamb? No. Luxinger? Yes. I'm sorry. Matheson? Yes. Rutt? Yes. Hobbs? Yes. Van Portfleet? Yes. Narsh? Yes. Motion carries 6 1. Thank you. And. We go back to call the public on non-agenda items. Close call the public. Open it up to council comments. Mr. Matheson, sir. Nothing tonight other than to say that Halloween's coming up next week, so watch out for the kids while they're all getting their candy. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rutt? Um, just one thing. So we had a, jo a joint DDA Village Council committee meeting um, last week, and Really good meeting, and I'm really excited about the collaboration that happened, and um, we are working on a plan that will lead really to what we believe is a win-win for everybody. Um, now, council, both DDA council and village council, are working on you know details and all that kind of stuff, and we're looking to present um, a plan to move forward and collaborate together on the second meeting of November. So you can look forward to a presentation on just what has come out of that committee um, at that meeting. Details are continuing to be worked out. Yes. Good. Mr. Hobbs. Well, November 8th is coming up. 
good luck to all the candidates. And uh, this is our last council meeting like this. We'll see what happens by then. Good luck to everybody. Thank you. Mr. Lamb? No, I don't think so. We cancel? I think it's like the first one. No, the first Tuesday is the uh, election on the 8th, and then the council meeting. I'll have seven. to look, look at the calendar then. Yeah. I think we have okay. one more chance to pass those two years. Am I turn to talk? Yeah. It is, sir. So I, I, I had to answer a couple of questions. I'm going to try not to Excuse be me, can you pull your mic down? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm going to answer a couple of questions I received um, about the money. Always talking about the money. So the village of Lake Orion is a fully developed community, and the village at large outside of the downtown development district has no developable property left. That means that the income for the village, the village proper, will increase only at a rate of 3% a year. That's inflation average for the last 20 some years. So there's no new revenues coming to the village of Lake Orion except through inflation or if you tear down your house or business and build a new, new one. Now there's, there's a couple of lots here and there, right? So there is no, let me repeat myself again so everyone understands me, there is no new income source coming to the village. That being said, I hear public acknowledgement now that we have somewhere between seven and $21 million in infrastructure improvements in the village to be had. How will those be paid for? Water and sewer projects are usually funded through user fees because we use the sewer and we use the water so we are charged for our use. So I'm almost going to promise you that when we rebuild the pump stations for $7 million, and we finish phase two of the water main, there will be new, quote, user fees or taxes to pay for them because there is no extra money in the budget. We went through this last year with Mr. Young asking him about the two hundred dollars to $400,000 deficit in the budget, and he managed to find the money in a fund somewhere to balance the budget. So there we, that's the money. Those are the facts about the money. I would like to comment on the DDA bonds. I, I believe the DDA in its present, present condition is going to be able to fully fund five, 10, 15 million dollars in bonds. The DDA budget is supposed to increase by over $500,000 in the next four years. Okay, all of the new development projects, and we'll share 90 million, we've repeated this, all of those projects are going to go into the DDA coffers. Okay. They are guaranteed to have an income stream, and I assume in four years they're going to have a budget larger than the village of Lake Orion, which is fine if that's what the people want. The last income was, I, most recently I was asked, why did you pass the tax abatement? And I said, well, I objected to the tax abatement, but it really didn't matter if we gave it to them or not, because the West Development with the school rehab project is all in the DDA district. So all of the taxes for the project and benefits are going to go to the DDA. The taxes are not going to go to the village, no matter how you skin it. So it doesn't matter. We give them all tax abatements because the money is not being taken from the village coffers. So those are some facts I wanted to share. I had some people who questioned me. Your facts, your facts, your facts. Those are the facts. So thank you. And I'll have candy at my house. Anybody wants to come by? You get three pieces. Well, you also have three points. That it, sir? In your front yard. <laughs> Mr. Nars. And I'm giving away revenue bonds <laughs> for trick or treat. So <laughs> if I can get five million of you folks to show up, we're covered. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, no, I'm, I'm glad to see you know people coming tonight because even even though we're drilling behind the scenes, we're volunteers and we're residents just like you. So keep in mind. Everything that we agree to, we're on the hook <laughs> along with you. So we're partners with that. I'm an invested uh, property owner and I'll be a lifelong, or as my wife puts it, um, I, I was here from the moment I came to the US and she says, and I'll probably die here. Um, but she loves her home, she loves her town. Um, we do have redevelopment. There is income potential for every community. Every community is in the same boat and the redevelopment is limitless. And uh, that potential exists, that is income. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of great things going on. So 
we, I, I appreciate the comments. I appreciate people coming and listening, contributing. But just know that every community out there, if they list their entire amount of uh, debt for all of their infrastructure and all of their needs, is going to be just as, in fact, most communities um, would, would just really be happy to pick up our projected 20 million. Um, that's nothing for most communities. So every community has that. And again, I, I've been working in government for almost 40 years. Um, every community has massive debt. And, and we look at it collectively and totally because we want to be able to project that. And then we do usually three to five year plans um, on how we're going to repair that and service that. So the good news for us is streets and roads, yes, those can be what's called a SAD or a special assessment district. Um, but the majority of the time we find a way to either bond those or do those in, in pieces. And uh, our roads aren't as nearly in bad shape as our uh, lift stations and uh, uh, our water and sewer, those phases that we're doing right now. The good news is those are those revenue bonds that do not go against our general debt. So that is an enterprise fund, water and sewer, and that is uh, funded separately, and those bonds do not go against our general fund debt. So we're working on that. It's going to take time. Um, but I can tell you this, we're in better shape, um, I believe, today than we were four years ago when we were first debating um, on how we were going to approach both the lift stations and uh, our phased uh, increase in our uh, water infrastructure. And both of those are now underway and uh, they're gonna be afforded. So, um, love the public comment, glad everybody's here and happy Halloween. Thank you, Ms. Austin. I had the pleasure of going to the Michigan Municipal League Convention this uh, past week. Um, I just had a GI scope, so I'm losing my voice. It's not because I had such a good time at the convention, which ended two nights ago. Um, but I will give a report on that um, next. Well, it might be crazy next time. I'll give my report the next, after we get our new, or if we have the same, oh, after the election, the first meeting after the election. There we go. I'll give a report on the, that convention. That's the 14th. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I'm not up for re-election. I can wait. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. We'll look forward to that. Uh, a couple comments. I have uh, a few things said tonight about the facts. You need to discover the facts for yourself. The facts can just be one's belief. The facts, you need to go out there and uncover them and do your homework for yourself. And there's resources for that. Uh, this community really needs to work together. There's been statements made about that as well, and that's one of the things that I see happening, and I think there'll be a lot of opportunities for that. And the charrette, the DDA charrette, that's this Thursday. There was a lot of discussion about parking tonight, and parking is not what this is all about. Please attend. Get clear on that. Learn what there are for the opportunities for the community as a whole. And that's it for me. Anything from you, Mr. O'Neill? Only that we are uh, nearing the end of our drawdown. The tube is just trickling out. And we don't know. Some people were complaining that it wasn't down a lot last week. Uh, of course, I wasn't here five years ago. I don't know. We only let it down as far as we can let it down as fast. We're not going to wash Mr. Rear's building down the street, but but it's it's. I think everybody can see their their the, the ground by their seawalls and get their work done. If they can't, well, it's still open, but we got to close it up on the seventh of of November. The seventh of November, it will be closed up and the water will start to rise right. with the assistance of Mother Nature. Okay. That's All right, fun. good. And that's with the intention of it being back up the full lake level height by mid-December? Well, I think the, the, the winter level, I think, is what we shoot for. Okay, winter level is one foot below mean level. Yes. Okay. Is that's that it, up sir? to Mother Nature. Is that it, sir? That's it, thank you. Okay, entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Court. All those in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed?
Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.